Welcome to Thou Shalt Not Suffer, the Witch Trial Podcast. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. In this episode, we speak with descendants of Connecticut witch trial victims about efforts to exonerate their ancestors. I am one of those descendants. I'm not descended from anyone accused in Connecticut, but I am descended from some of the Salem accused. I am as well. That's why when I found Winifred Benham in my tree and it said that she was the witch of Wallingford, Connecticut, and I looked into it and she was actually an accused witch, I was very baffled because I knew nothing about witch trials outside of Salem. Not many people know there were witch trials in Connecticut, but we're hoping to change that. That is changing. Where people are learning every day, there's been a lot of it in the news lately. And of course, we've done several episodes of the podcast about Connecticut. And people are finding out through social media as well. It's a very exciting change for the history. And I'm really hoping that the descendants can start to feel camaraderie and learn about their ancestors from each other. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Connecticut decides to do with this history. Hopefully they do the right thing with it and exonerate those accused and make this part of everyone's education so people know the stories and we don't make these same mistakes again. We're going to find out what these descendants that we've brought together have to say about those things. I'm sure they have some good things to say, perhaps some profound things to say about their feelings, how they felt when they discovered these ancestors, how they feel now, what they think about the Connecticut Witch Trial Exoneration Project. Watching this exoneration project come together has been really beautiful. We've come a long way since May. We have. In May, there was just a few of us trying to talk about it. We were throwing it out there. Who can hear it? And I was just watching you tweet. But then we came together in June and formed the project. And we've had media attention. We've got the podcast going. We've got the social media going. There are eyes on it now. There is. We've learned a lot from many of the descendants. The resolution is being discussed by members of the Connecticut General Assembly. We're hoping that they do take it up to vote on it in their next session. Which is upon us. Soon. Soon, soon. It starts the beginning of January, in fact, but I know it runs until June. So we'll just keep plugging away while they're working. We'll be trying to get their ears and to get them to focus on this and get it done. Hopefully sooner rather than later. I definitely think they'll have some things to think about after hearing the powerful words of our descendants on this episode. Josh, do you have any Connecticut history for us today? For this episode's history segment, I'm going to talk about the witch trial victims who were the ancestors of the descendants we spoke to. There are five ancestors of these eight individuals. Four of the descendants are related to Alice Young of Windsor, who was the first known person to be executed for witchcraft in the American colonies on May 26, 1647. One of our descendants is related to Lydia Gilbert of Windsor, who was hanged in 1654. Another is related to Rebecca Greensmith of Hartford, who was hanged in 1662 or 3 with her husband Nathaniel. Then we have Mary Barnes of Farmington, who was hanged in 1663. And finally, our Sarah Jack is descended from Winifred Benham Sr. of Wallingford, who was the second of three generations of women to be accused of witchcraft. Her mother, Mary Hale, was hanged for witchcraft in Boston. Winifred Sr. was acquitted of witchcraft twice. 
and her daughter, Winifred Benham Jr., was also acquitted of witchcraft. Their last trials were in 1697, and so they were the last two accused of witchcraft to be taken to trial. Awesome. Josh, thank you for covering all that descendant and ancestor information for us today. It was my pleasure. I'm really looking forward to talking to these descendants now. And here are my fellow descendants talking about their ancestor and why this project has been important to them. Sherry Kuiper, descendant of Alice Young. Alsie Freeman, descendant of Alice Young. Rosemary Blake, descendant of Mary Barnes. Morgan Lee Kelsey, descendant of Alice Young. Sue Bailey, descendant of Alice Young. Laura Secord, descendant of Lydia Gilbert, Caitlin Golden, descendant of Rebecca Greensmith. And Sarah Jack, descendant of Winifred Benham Sr. How did you find out about your ancestor who was accused of witchcraft? Sherry? Mom's retired, and she's the one who does all the research in our family, and I'm the one who will say, get in the car and let's drive to Connecticut and see what we can find. And we like it that way. It works really well. And we call it visits, right? We go visit our ancestors. So she has a cousin that they do some research together on the family. And we were all together one day and he said, I think we have an accused witch. And I was like, no way. I didn't believe it. And then he said, it's on the internet. Look it up. And I was like, okay. I mean, Google is great and all, but that's not how genealogy works, right? And my mom was like, let's just look and see. And so we started looking and it made some logical sense. So then my mom really started digging into it. And all the way up until her daughter, we had a paper trail. And then the Associated Daughters of Early American Witches, which is one of the many lineage societies out there, that this one is dedicated to those accused and hanged of witchcraft. They had that missing link from her daughter to her. So it was really just this conversation. In fact, I was the naysayer. I was like, there's no way we have somebody who's this uh, fascinating, a part of American history and early American history. But he was absolutely right. And we were able to do the research and prove it. I'll see. My sibling who had access to the family history library did extensive genealogical work. And somehow I had missed the bottom line of their research, which all it said was all young, 1600 to 1647 parentheses, which, and I don't think I had even gotten to the bottom of that list, but it was in March of 2020 that I went and had a gathering with a lot of my family members on my dad's side. And they were talking about their ancestors with certain fondness. And then right after that, the pandemic hit. And I felt, well, I, I want to go deep into this genealogy myself. And it was a chance I could do a free trial for one month on one of these websites and learn a lot more than I already knew. But my sibling had already done all this great research. So most of what I did was just corroborate, fact-checking various other people's accounts, making sure that there was no errors in what my sibling had done. And it led back to Alf Young died in 1647. Rosemary? This genealogy was presented to my mother when I was a baby. And when I was older, I read about it, found out about Mary Burns being an accused witch. And in the genealogy, it said she was accused of drunkenness and fornication. So I was just appalled and I started looking into her a little bit. And that was probably 40 years ago, and I found nothing. There seems to be a whole lot more online, especially to find out about her. But I'm not ashamed or anything about it, because she was probably just an innocent woman. And I remember quite a few years ago, there was a presentation at the Old State House in Hartford. It was made as a halloween event. And they had a, a little play going, and it was about Mary Barnes. And I knew that we were descended from her somehow. So I went to this play, and the old state house was packed. And I think I was the only one that cried. I thought, oh my God, this is my relative. It's so sad. And 
for everybody else, it was just a Halloween event. Morgan? So my dad passed away in 2016, and he had done a lot of genealogy. So Alice is on his father's side, and he had done up to one generation prior to Alice, to Alice's daughter, the other Alice. And when I saw Alice's name, there was some kind of knowing within me that just sparked a curiosity and a need to dig further. And so I ended up just simply Googling Alice Young, and all of a sudden, it brings up that she was the first in the colonies to be executed. And I felt pretty shocked by that, very shocked by that. Sue. A friend of Beth Caruso's from Windsor is my massage therapist. And her name is Donna. And she told me, oh, yeah, my friend wrote a book about the first uh, accused witch that was executed. And I said, oh, that's really cool. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. Well, I had my genetics done. And I see this relative that was a second cousin. I'm like, who is this person? So you can email someone through 23andMe, which I did. He was an elderly gentleman, but his daughter answered me and said, oh, I've done a lot of research on the family on that side. That would be my mother's father's side. And we're related to the first person executed as a witch in the colonies. I said, oh, my God, it must be Alice Young. And it was. And then I started looking just online through all the genealogies that are available. I'm actually paying a genealogist to do a whole view of all four sides of me now, just because I want to have show my kids. And they thought it was pretty cool. Laura? My husband is a historian genealogist. And I think he'd gone in his family all the way back to the beginning of time. And one day he just came and he was looking at my family. I didn't even know he was looking at my family. And he came and said, well, your great, 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 great was found guilty of witchcraft in Connecticut in 1654. Caitlin? So I am an avid Ancestry user, like Ancestry.com. And I had found her name, but I didn't look too much into her until I got a hint that was talking about the witch trials. And of course, that was eye-catching to me. And so I read about her and I'm like, oh my gosh, I never knew about the Connecticut witch trials. Of course, I knew about Salem. We talked about it in school. But the Connecticut witch trials was never something I knew about. I knew that Salem wasn't the only trials, but then I watched her and my jaw dropped. It's absolutely insane and horrible what she and all of these other victims went through. And it just hurts knowing like she was a mother and I can't imagine how her children felt. Thank you, Caitlin. Finally, we have our very own host, Sarah Jack. I was working on a family line, and it was one of the first ones that took me to Connecticut. And I started reading through documents, and I saw that this person was an accused witch. And I didn't understand how that could be because it was not Salem. Thank you, Sarah. How did you feel when you learned about your ancestor who was accused of witchcraft? When I was in college, I took a really amazing class at Edinburgh University with a woman named Dr. Jen Rett. And she did a class called History of Witchcraft, which was about the Reformation all the way up through the Salem witch trials. And she took us to Salem on Halloween weekend. And it was amazing, right? probably the coolest class trip in the world. I've always been interested in that and always fascinated by it. I don't know if I had any feelings of anything. I thought it was, I hate to say this because people died, but I thought it was really cool because I thought that these people who did get accused and didn't die from it, they were kind of badass. And I'm allowed to swear on your podcast. <laughs> they were people who really kind of bucked the system in a lot of ways. And usually that's what got them to be an outcast where they were different. In that respect, I thought it was really cool that my ancestor was somebody who was causing enough trouble (laughs) that they felt that this was the way to deal with her. And then when a lot of my friends found out, you know, a lot of them were like, we're not surprised that you were descended from somebody like this. So that's kind of how that initial feeling was. 
And then, of course, you know, it just kept going from there. And then really understanding, too, like, yeah, there's that kind of interesting history part of it. But then there's the reality part of it, of what really happened to these people, my ancestor and all the others. And then that kind of manifested more in just a little bit of activism that all of us share today. Once I kind of knew that connection with 95% certainty, I just tried to read anything I could to find out more about her. And really, there just wasn't very much at all. Just putting myself in her shoes at the time, it really just struck me with extreme sadness. Like, I remember getting goosebumps all over my body and just like a chill running through my body and a thinking feeling in my stomach, just putting myself into her shoes and being almost being there on the gallows, looking down at my six or seven year old daughter. And then putting myself in the daughter's shoes, who's also my ancestor, of looking up at her mother thinking, what's going on? I don't understand what's happening. And just that moment, whether or not it's actually how things went down, I really was chilled by it. And it really stuck with me and I wept. And part of the reason I wept, I think, is just the extreme feeling of injustice that was done. and. So much injustice has been done to so many people through our nation's history, but this was like a really visceral feeling for me where I I actually felt connected with my ancestor in a way that I hadn't felt very connected to any other ancestor that I'd ever heard about. I had this connection with Al and her daughter. And so it was soon after that that I decided to carry the name Al or all C is how I pronounce it. So I still keep the letter C from my given name. But I felt like it was a way that I could honor my ancestor and keep her memory alive in a way. From there, I realized that there were hundreds and thousands of people potentially who were interested in the same thing, who were also descendants. I got connected with Beth Crusoe's Connecticut Witch Memorial Facebook page and started following those updates. And those updates led me to learn about the campaign to have the witching victims exonerated. And so everything just flowed from there where I've seen that there's potentially hundreds of thousands of people who, if they knew, they are actually descended from these witching victims. And potentially millions of Americans are connected in some way to this legacy through their blood. I was baffled. I was very eager to get more information. And then I was quickly disappointed that there really wasn't much. And Connecticut wasn't offering information about their witch trials. So I really had to dig around. And I found that extremely disappointing. Do you think your ancestors should be exonerated? There's no graveyard that I can actually go visit my ancestor. There's just a brick in Hartford in the courthouse square. And it feels not like a true memorial that it just says witch hanging victim and doesn't really speak to who she was as a person. We don't have very many details. I just want to be clear that, you know, my ancestor's exoneration is not more important than other wrongfully accused people. And so I'm really grateful that your podcast is also highlighting modern day victims and the witch hunt. Another thing I just want to mention is our country has a huge reckoning to do in terms of understanding its past and making amends and seeking justice, specifically focusing on the case of all. Absolutely, she needs to be exonerated by the state of Connecticut because, first of all, there's no record of any actual harm she committed upon anyone. There are no records. Secondly, if current laws do not penalize practices which can be considered witchcraft, then those who are punished for them need exoneration under the current laws, is the way I see it. And it's just as simple as the state of Connecticut allowing posthumous pardon. This should not be such a big challenge, and it should just be a stepping stone to open the door to all types of people rectifying injustice that has been committed against them and their family. Yes, of course. I think they all of them should be, especially because did she really do any harm to anybody? Was it just 
people's words that accused her, she should be exonerated. And I think they all should be. I don't think whatever she did, does she deserved to be hanged for. So I hope they do exonerate them. I do. I do. I think that it's all so complicated. There's a lot of layers there. I think that it is important to exonerate or to restore the good name. One, just to kind of bring some light to that and to bring some awareness to people. Generally, if I'm talking with anybody about that, I feel like there's always some sort of an education that ends up happening because they're like, I didn't know. Or people just think, oh, you know, the witches, they burned the witches, they hung the witches. What are the witches, really? What do we often do to people who might be a little different or might be the people that are the healers, the people that are bringing truth and light to situations and nobody wants to hear or accept that sometimes. Just the fact that people could have gotten together, tortured people, then killed them and said that that was okay and that that was in the name of God is horrific and... I think that people really should be made aware of that. Yes, I do. And I can't even believe there was, uh, when this was brought up in 2008 in the legislature, that they didn't do it. What in the world are they thinking? That, well, we don't have any proof they weren't witches. What kind of crazy thing is that? How is it that they couldn't say, of course, we're going to exonerate them? Salem did it. Why in the world wouldn't we? It doesn't make sense. I have like a list of reasons witches need to be exonerated because they're, first of all, the main reason is they were innocent. They were falsely accused. They were almost always women. So there was not entirely, but the both were women. They weren't weak. They weren't women that were easily duped by evil. They were the participants who helped to build this country. Mothers, wives, health maids human beings, healers. Without them, we wouldn't have created what we have in this country now. Because their lives and their stories paint a clear picture of what our country's beginning was like. Because as modern persons, you and I have attained levels of knowledge and education, and we now understand the science of nature behind the colonists' irrational fears. Because women were part of founding this country. Because these persons are our family. And we want them remembered, celebrated, and honored instead of carrying the stain of disgrace based in ignorance and hysteria. And because today, forces of false truth, hysteria, and misogyny are rising up again vilifying and naming women criminals, liars, and manipulators. Just like everyone else, she was innocent. She was just trying her best to live, just live a simple life back then. And this is just a big human rights violation simply because people disliked her and she didn't have a good reputation. They figured, hey, let's just call her a witch and that's all of her. We'll see. It's wrong and it's horrible. Yes. I want to acknowledge that they should not have been water tested, that they should not have had to flee. Why is it important for your ancestor's name to be cleared? And it's not even just her name, right? It's all of their names. It doesn't matter if it was three days ago or 300 years ago, a wrong thing was done. And even though that the state of Connecticut saying, I'm sorry, Sherry, that we did this to your grandmother isn't going to change anything. Just that recognition that, hey, this was a crappy thing that happened and it should have never happened. Sometimes we have to own those mistakes, even though we might have not been the ones who directly made it. Do I think anybody alive today had anything to do with this? Absolutely not. But just to really remind people, because you can look at some things going on in society today and there's been references made to modern day witch hunts. And while we might not hang people from trees like that happened to Alice, there are still things going on today. And we just need to remind ourselves 
how easy we can fall into those traps. It's just important for all of those people, all those ancestors. I can prove that this is my grandmother's. So to say that nobody around today cares is not fair. And frankly, I think that it's, while I'm sure there's red tape of bureaucracy, as there always is, I don't think it's as hard as they're making it to just come together and say, these people are no longer accused and we exonerate them. And I am glad that there are people finally in the state of Connecticut who are trying to help us move towards that resolution. The cider goes bad and they're accused of being a witch or all the children in the town get sick, but your own. So you must be in league with the devil to protect them. Stupid things like that. It's just so unfair. Nobody listen to anything they said. I'm sure it was a jury of all men. Magistrates were all men. And they were just lowly housewives. <laughs> so nobody cared what they had to say. So yes, they should all be exonerated. It's important because although we don't know much about them, we do know that they were not witches. I don't want anybody in this country confused anymore about these victims that went through these witch trials and if the state of connecticut clears the names of their accused it's a giant statement towards clarifying that these were innocent people why is exoneration relevant today i think exoneration is relevant today because this case and these cases of the 11 which hang victims in Connecticut can be a teachable moment for us that these people were scapegoated in the past, most likely for something they did not do wrong, but some huge upheavals were happening in society at the time. There was a flu outbreak that was killing a lot of people, including many children, as Beth Caruso points out in her research. And so you got to look at what's going on today with how people are being scapegoated for the various ills um, that are afflicting society. What I'm hopeful for is that my ancestor's case can be this way to highlight retrospectively how scapegoating is a part of our culture, how we're constantly looking for someone to blame these days often very in a very partisan way, but throughout our nation's history, we have blamed others. We've blamed the other for a lot of our collective problems that need a collective solution. Just to bring up the history of our treatment of the indigenous people of this country. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. To me, it, it's an even higher level of heartbreaking, even than just my ancestors standing on a gallows. I know that other ancestors of mine participated in some of these colonial battles and even like an indigenous child, one of my ancestors did. And so that for me is a great reckoning that I need to come to terms with myself. And I think it's very hard for our country to come to terms with that part of the story. So it's a little easier for us to focus on the tragedy in the colony. But the tragedy outside the colony was just so monumental that in the course of what we're doing, we need to like remember that that is a part of it too. That is the context in which this was happening. I think just like acknowledging that the people were there before these, the colony would be one starting point. I think the passage of time doesn't negate the wrong. Just because it's a long time ago doesn't mean that it's too late to do some sort of retroactive exoneration to right or wrong. And it would be for all their relatives. I mean, some people might think, oh, well, that was cool that they were accused. Or I like to think that they were really a witch or something. I just can't help but think most people, when they find out they had a relative that goes back nine, ten generations, that's a person just like we are, that has all the same feelings and fears and loves people. And why would 
their death be any less meaningful 375 years later. It's still the fact that they were put to death wrongly, undoubtedly wrongly. It's just an injustice that needs to be addressed even 375 years later. While most of us look at witch trials as though that's just in my history book, it's still happening today in other countries around the world. And so if we make a good example, maybe it'll stop worldwide. I hope that when Connecticut exonerates their accused, which is that it'll send a message and a signal to leaders and communities in other parts of the world where witch hunts are being tolerated. I want the message to be that we must stand against witch hunting, that it's no longer something that is acceptable, that it is murder, that it is destroying families, and it does not need to happen anymore. What would you like to say to the Connecticut General Assembly about why your ancestors should be exonerated? Like, just do it. Like, seriously, it's really that easy. And I know we can come up with lots of reasons why it's difficult, but just do it. I mean, because people said to me, well, sure, it happened so long ago. Who cares? I'm like, well, then just do it. Who cares? Just get up there and say it, sign a piece of paper and, and be done with it. It's the right thing to do. And you just got to do it. And Massachusetts has done it. Salem has fully embraced what has happened to their people to almost to do a complete 180 or 360 really of what happened there. So I just tell state of Connecticut, just review it, do what you got to do, but get it done. It's long overdue and there's no reason we should be waiting any longer. I think the basic requests we have are acknowledge that the injustice happened, recognize officially the innocence of these 11 victims who were executed and recognize not only their suffering, but also their family and their descendants. Removing the ill fame from their descendants, that's one part of it. Reversing the charges is the bottom line. But I would add one extra thing, which is just, we need to educate people on this history, not just a little paragraph on Wikipedia, but people need to be taught in schools about what happened in our country. and. It's going to be a long story to tell, but that is part of the way you can get closer to a country that has justice, um, which we are supposedly a country of justice and a country of laws. So you can't tell that story and then hide the story where injustice was committed. And so the basic step forward is we need to move on to an education piece after we've exonerated these people. Because their story needs to continue to be told. It's not to close the book and never talk about them again. Because Mary Burns was just a housewife and a mother taking care of her farm and her children. She was accused of something. We don't even really know what. That probably didn't harm anybody. And she should be exonerated. In all fairness, all of them should be. If that passes, that to me almost feels like it heals something in my DNA and in the DNA of others and in the DNA of future generations. And I think that can be thought in a larger view. If you take that same principle and apply that to a whole lot of other things, if you apply that to Native Americans and you apply that to people who have been oppressed and murdered. That's huge. So what I would say to the Connecticut General Assembly is that that is an important motion, an important movement for the future of all people. The people that were executed were more than likely innocent. And for what comfort it can bring their souls now or their relatives who are still alive, if it can bring them comfort and some measure of closure, I think it's a small task for them. I mean, it would be really good gesture on the part of the legislature, the old Connecticut General Assembly, whatever they called themselves back then, I forgot. 
the management of the co- colony. Maybe they're the ones that voted on deciding that she should die. Now here, this current legislature could vote on freeing those people from that stigma of potentially being a witch or being an evil person. They were put to death. I mean, I think it's still really important. The length of time that's elapsed doesn't mute the wrong. And it's still something that's important. I think I would, again, say this was a big human rights violation. And it's not fair that even after death, she and as many other people are still considered criminals, even though they were very clearly innocent. And as a descendant, it would mean the world to me to be able to have her name cleared. And I'm sure she would have been ecstatic, as well as everyone else, to finally be recognized, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. I was just a victim. I want the exoneration to acknowledge that all the Connecticut accused should not have had their good names to the fate. What type of memorial do you want to see? I would like to see a memorial. I do like them because I do think it serves as a reminder of things that have happened. I love visiting historical places and everything. So I think it would just really be dependent on where it is. I think it would need to be Hartford Square there, where a lot of the victims were hanged. Something in a place like that, I think, would be ideal because it's in a place of significance. It's a place where people are going to see it and actually stop. If you put it in the middle of nowhere, like I love all the small Connecticut towns, my whole family's from up there. If you go back far enough, I think it loses its value. So I think it needs to go in a significant place where it's actually going to be seen. I love Windsor, Connecticut. It's a beautiful little town, but you're not going there unless you're going there for a very specific reason. Hartford Square, it's in the center of town, a popular place where people go. So I think it would be great if it's put in a place that's going to actually reach people just to bear their names and probably with whatever words it is that exonerates them, however the state is going to recognize that. I think would be really important, but definitely to put their names in there because I'm a big believer that as long as your name is out there, your legacy will live on. People will be able to look up Alice Young. It's on the internet. They can read about her and know a little bit about her. I would love to be part of coming up with what that would look like. And I would love to be present on it. Initiated. My ancestor, she's dead and she's not going to ever be able to feel that vindication of being cleared. At least I don't think she will. But I really like to believe that her story could be an example of how we as a society can learn to make peace with the past and also learn from our errors. So I would love to see the memorial kind of speak to that, that we are learning from the past and we are going to move forward as a country of justice. Well, no brooms or funny hats for sure. Something beautiful, a little bench for people to sit and contemplate. Everybody's name's inscribed. They have something like that in Salem. That's a nice, peaceful area. Something along those lines. Not religious and not Halloween y. Well, it shouldn't have a pointy hat, I'll tell you that. It was talked about, I think maybe when I was interviewed for that Channel 30 thing that it, it was a joke when the legislate when they were addressing this before in 2008 in the legislature, like they didn't take it seriously. I mean, the people that were in the legislature reviewing it. And I think if you put a pointy hat on the statue, much as it's amusing, it doesn't take it seriously enough. Should it be a woman? Yeah, why not? It, it should be a statue of a woman. I mean, men were accused too, though. I mean, maybe you want a woman and a man. How about this? Is this too much like the Kennedy grave, like an eternal flame? That meaning that you could do something like that would be cheaper too. That or if something peaceful, but something that symbolizes continuity of life and the fact that the tiny lapsing is of no significance. It's just as relevant today as it was then. Something to show that the memory of what they went through goes on. If there can be like some kind of like plaque or monument, maybe, or maybe since she was a mom, maybe it would be possible to have a little playground. I think that would be nice. 
So I feel like she would like that for children to be able to play there and you can still have remembrance for them. I want their names on it, but I want if other people are discovered their names to be able to be added. I want it to be accessible. I don't want it to be a side. I want it to be a monument that is known so that the history is known. But I want it to represent that a new page has been turned in that book. What does the Exoneration Project mean to you? It's great that all this information is coming out. Witches aren't evil, I don't think. Uh, And I think by presenting all this information that you are will help people to realize that they are just people. And people need to know that they're just innocent women, really, and men. And it was a tough time. I guess it's something that I never expected to be a part of that really caught me by surprise, just the discovery of the situation and my, my tie to it. To me, all of it just really feels like it's all about healing. I think whenever you can go and go look back and look at wrongs that were done and try to do something about it, I mean, you can't take it back. But I think when you educate people, when you look forward, when you look at something and say this can never happen again, I think that's the most important part of it. I think for me, I always love history and any chance I can get to volunteer or help for a cause beyond me always makes me very happy. If I can get the word out, better educate myself on this and help better educate other people, I think it's just making a difference in many people's lives. Have you felt more connected to your accused ancestor due to the project? Yeah. When I do research and find these fascinating people in our history, which I believe everybody has fascinating people in their genealogy, we just have to find it and find their stories. So whether it's Alice Young or whether it's some of the other really neat people in my history, I think it's just important to remember it and to talk about it and to really understand what their life was like. The more I learned about her and the closer I looked at some of the things and being involved in the Associated Daughters of Early American Witches, it just made me realize that more needed to be done for these folks. Like thanks to, to the great internet and social media and stuff, I've been able to support it in a lot of ways from afar. And I find that really important because even though it's, what, 370 some years since since Alice Young was hanged and the ones who came after her, there's really still been no justice for a lot of them. And so it's important. it's important to recognize those wrongs, even if it's 300 years later. We still... It's still important for, for us to recognize that as a country, well, pre, I guess pre-country, but as colonial Americans, like these things happened, they happened in Connecticut, and it would be really nice if they would just take the steps to rectify what had happened. Definitely do feel a connection, and I really would like to learn more about her and try to go back. Yeah, I do feel deeply connected, and I think it's when you go back that many generations, it seems so far back. And it's almost like having that knowledge is, I guess it's more a piece that's in my heart that I feel. Um, but you feel like you're able to just reach back into the past and pull that to you. And I guess even just thinking of that's your grandmother and thinking of that female lineage and thinking of how incredibly far back that traces her it just feels like there's this palpable line to the past and this woman that I feel like is now right here that I never knew about. I would definitely say so. I feel a lot more connected. The more I learn about her, the more obviously I want to help get her exonerated as well as everyone else. Yeah, I do. I definitely feel a lot more connected to her. I do because I'm hearing what the project and the ancestors mean to the other descendants. And it helps me to see that I'm not the only one that feels this way. Do you think any differently about what you've been taught about history? 
I don't recall ever learning anything in history class about the witches, maybe a little bit of the witch trials. Probably we had to read the crucible. Other than that, most of my learning has been as an adult, an older adult. I think the history classes are changing in a lot of ways, and that's one one the way they could present it differently to kids, just like with Columbus and all of those discoverers, supposedly. I think, I think they should change the presentation for witches as well, because I think kids still, it's Halloween, it's, you know, pointy black hats and brooms and things, so be nice to portray them more as just women that were mistreated. I definitely feel like I haven't learned everything that maybe should have been taught to me because I would have never known about the Connecticut witch trials if I had never found Rebecca Greensmith in my family tree. I definitely feel like a lot of it is not discussed because of how dark it is or there's just some things that maybe the school systems don't feel is necessary to teach. But in cases like the Connecticut witch trials, any witch trials, I think it's really important to discuss so that we don't repeat history because it's still happening today. People are being accused and executed because of it, and it's wrong. So clearly we haven't learned that lesson. Do you feel more hopeful? I feel more hopeful because I think the big shift was there is somebody in the government in Connecticut who has taken up this case. And so that, to me, was a big thing of hope because with any sort of legislation of any kind, you need somebody to pick it up and look at it and say, you know what, I think this is important enough to move forward with it. So that actually is a huge thing. And so that kind of coupled with some of the press that we've been able to do over the past few months with that person picking up that piece of paper and saying, you know what, this is worth it and I'm going to look into this. It does give me hope. And I think we've got a lot of great forward momentum. And I think we need to keep showing this legislator why this is important. And however we need to show up for her to carry that on, I think this is really going to be it. And I think this is probably the best shot we've had ever to get something done. I am just grateful that somebody finally picked it up and said, you know what, this is important and we're going to take a look at it. I'm very excited that thousands of people are working on a collective solution for this one problem. And I hope that we can build off that and develop more collective action that lift up our country's people instead of tearing them down. And now here's Sarah Jack with an important update on witch hunts happening in our world right now. Here is End Witch Hunts World Advocacy News. You are living in a world with a pervasive belief in harmful witchcraft with a mass occurrence of holding women and children responsible for supernaturally causing death, illness, and misfortune. This deep-seated conclusion is delaying action for protecting alleged witches, promoting witch hunting behaviors, and blurring the recognition that worldwide historic witch trials executed innocent humans. These are communities that are waiting to be made safe. These are behaviors that have no place in a world that seeks to protect the vulnerable. These historic victims should have their names cleared and their innocence acknowledged by the communities that prosecuted them. When any advocate asks for this, ears should be listening, minds should be realizing, and bodies should be moving to take action. I hope you have had a chance to look up Dr. Leo Igwe of the Nigerian organization, The Advocacy for Alleged Witches. Please find the website link in our show notes. Here's a quote from a recent message from Leo. Part of the objective of advocacy for alleged witches is to tackle the misperceptions of witches and witchcraft, whether alleged or not. Advocacy for alleged witches seeks to address associated fears and suspicions. It aims to correct the pervasive misconceptions and fears associated with the term witch or witchcraft, because these misperceptions are at the root of witch persecution. Saving alleged witches cannot be realized until Nigerians disabuse their mind and free themselves from fears and suspicions that the term witches are witchcraft and genders. So the mission of combating witch persecution and supporting victims starts in the mind. It starts by demystifying the term witchcraft or witches. It starts by clarifying misconceptions and misperceptions that are linked to terminologies such as witches, witchcraft, and supposed occult forces. Can you accept this change in thinking? 
Consider it a message not just for Nigeria, but also for you and every human. As Leo states, misconceptions linked to the idea of witches, witchcraft, and harmful occult forces must be demystified. It is time to stop obscuring the truth and start diffusing the panic that is ignited by what we fear as malevolent. Last week, I brought attention to a situation in Ireland. The Northern Ireland Borough of Larney wants to commemorate eight witch trial victims from the Island McGee witch trial that took place on March 31, 1711. A borough councillor raised questions of whether the eight women and a man who were found guilty of witchcraft were actually innocent. When criticized for his deferral of action due to what authority he perceives the council holds, he has stated that actually he feels ambivalent about the matter of innocence. Ambivalent? He feels the council does not have authority to acknowledge innocence due to obscurity around witches and witchcraft. He is, however, interested in having tourists play a game of determining guilt of these historical people that are still waiting to have their names cleared. He wants their convictions left alone, but he wants to draw tourists to the historic site by the opportunity to vote for guilt or innocence with tokens. This incident on the other side of the world for me matters because I have asked the Connecticut legislature to exonerate the accused witches of Connecticut colony. I cannot imagine a response where the Connecticut legislature embraces ambivalence and suggests a tourist game at historical sites instead of exoneration and memorials. Please, hear your community and the descendants of accused witches when they say that recognizing innocence matters. It matters to women and children that are being attacked as witches today. Acknowledging their innocence builds the foundation for dismantling witch hunt mentalities that are destroying lives in our modern world. While we watch and wait, let's support the victims across the world where innocent people are being targeted by superstitious fear. Support them by acknowledging and sharing their stories. Please use all your communication channels to be an intervener and stand with them. The world must stop hunting witches. Please follow our End Witch Hunts movement on Twitter at underscore End Witch Hunts and Visit our website at endwitchhunts.org. Thank you, Sarah, for that update. You're welcome. And thank you for listening to Thou Shalt Not Suffer, the Witch Trial Podcast. Join us next week. Like, subscribe, or follow wherever you get your podcasts. Visit at thoushaltnotsuffer.com. Remember to tell everyone you know about Thou Shalt Not Suffer, the Witch Trial Podcast. Support our efforts to end modern witch hunts. Visit endwitchhunts.org to learn more. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow.